All right, everybody, we are picking up on our study in the subject of soteriology. And uh, tonight we are moving into a new section where we are going to be looking at the doctrine of election. Uh, this is a subject that is part of uh, soteriology, so we want to uh, deal with it. And uh, tonight we're going to discuss this uh, important doctrine. And uh, we'll probably be here for a few weeks, I suspect, a uh, number of lessons on this. Let's go ahead and jump into the material. Now, election is a biblical teaching that every serious student of the Bible must consider at some point. As we read through the Bible, as we study through the Bible, we're going to deal with the subject of election. It's going to come up. Uh, it addresses issues related to God's sovereignty and human volition, uh, sin and salvation, justice and mercy, and love and faith. Now, given that election touches upon the infinite and eternal nature of God, it's not surprising that certain aspects of this doctrine transcend human understanding, similar to the biblical doctrines of the Trinity and the hypostatic union. Uh, and I bring up those two doctrines. I was actually discussing it with my wife because uh, when I was thinking about giving this introduction here, I was thinking about <laughs> doing somewhat of a dive into the doctrine of the Trinity and the hypostatic union, only because I think that they both serve as good examples of the doctrine of election. Uh, I put them in the same category, that is. When you think about the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, the scripture reveals that God exists, that he is one in essence, uh, but that he is three in person. Uh, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are co-equal, co-infinite, co-eternal, share exactly the same attributes, and are worthy of all honor and praise. And yet to try to understand the oneness in the, in the Trinity uh, becomes a challenge for us uh, as Christians. I know when you're looking at certain passages, and especially like the Hebrew numeral echad, uh, that does help. Uh, because even when you look at passages like Deuteronomy 6.4, uh, the Shema, uh, which says, Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheinu Yahweh Echad, uh, translated, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And that uh, statement of faith, that Shema, is still cited even today. Uh, but the use of the Hebrew numeral Echad uh, there that's translated one, uh, is understood uh, in a number of passages to be a complex one. For example, over in Genesis 2, we have the uh, passage where uh, Moses wrote about the husband and the wife, the man and the woman, uh, shall become one flesh, echad. He uses the term echad there. And what that means is that they function together as a complex unit, uh, they do not morph into an androgynous new species as though somehow they morph into something new. They retain their individuality and their individual identity and functionality as well, I might add. Uh, but nonetheless, they are regarded as one, one in unit, uh, one in purpose, one in function, one in agreement. And, and yet there is this complexity, uh, and the doctrine of the Trinity is, uh, is one of those doctrines that becomes a challenge. Because especially when we're dealing with someone infinite, like God himself, and of course we cannot cram uh, the ocean, we cannot pour the ocean into a thimble, and neither can we cram the infinite into the finite. So to try to grasp these things become a challenge. The doctrine of the hypostatic union is another one of those passages, or excuse me, doctrines that is uh, challenging to understand. Uh, again, only because of our finite ability to grasp things. The doctrine of the hypostatic union teaches that God the Son, at a point in time, nearly 2,000 years ago, added to himself perfect humanity. Of course, this happened in the womb of the Virgin Mary uh, by means of God the Holy Spirit. You can read about that in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 35. And the union is the union between God and man. But you have a union that is by its very nature difficult to try to understand because Jesus is undiminished deity. He is full deity. He is fully God. He is 100% God. And at the same time, he is 100% man. 
He is both. He is the theanthropic person. He is the God-man. You think of John 1, 1, which says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 14 tells us, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Colossians 2, 9 tells us, For in him, <clears throat> that is in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Of course, Hebrews 1, 8 is a very key passage as well. And it says, but of the Son, here talking about the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And so we understand the scriptures are very clear on the deity of Christ, uh, but he is also fully man. He is 100% man. Now, it's interesting because, and here I'm going to chase down some information on the footnote. Uh, in one, at, at, at certain times, Jesus spoke from his divine nature. And, and I'm bringing this up on purpose, so you have to follow me here. There are times that Jesus spoke from his divine nature. Uh, for example, in John 8, 58, when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, the I am statement there is one of several uh, that appear in the Gospel of John 7, if I remember correctly. But the Greek is agoami, and it's the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Yahweh, which is the proper name of God. Remember that when Moses was at the burning bush and he was being called by the Lord to service, and he said, who shall I say sent me? And the answer came back as Yahweh, which is the doubling of the Hebrew verb hayah, which is the verb to be. And so we understand that to be a reference to his eternal nature, I am that I am, or I am the eternally existent one. But when Jesus said to them here, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And it says that they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And this is because in this passage, this is one of those passages where Jesus is claiming to be God. He's claiming to have existed prior to uh, the hypostatic union. We think of also in John 17, 5, where Jesus is talking to the Father, and he says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. Notice, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. This is Jesus clearly talking from his divine nature prior to the hypostatic union, prior to uh, the time when God the Son added humanity to himself. And so there are times where Jesus spoke from his divine nature, uh, and yet, even though he existed before the world was, uh, there was a point in time when he came into being. Uh, Galatians 4.4, 4, Paul wrote, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, notice, born of a woman, born under the law. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And so this speaks about, again, the hypostatic union and the fact that Jesus took upon himself, the fact that God the Son took upon himself perfect humanity. So he is simultaneously eternal and yet in time. And again, we try to reconcile these things in our thinking. As God, he is omniscient. He knows all things. You think of Psalm 139, where David writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Notice, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down, and you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. And of course, as God, you know, God knows the hairs on our head. He knows how many times we blink in a day, how many times we breathe in a day. He, he's aware of everything and not just us, but 8 billion other people on the planet and every bird in the sky and every fish in the sea and every grain of sand upon the seashore. And not just on our planet, but, you know, there's 100 billion stars in our galaxy and there's upwards of 100 billion galaxies in the universe. And God knows it all right down to the tiniest molecule. He is aware of it. He is all-knowing, and yet Jesus, 
uh, not only was he born of a woman, but he had to learn. Luke 2.52, speaking of Jesus it, with regard to his humanity, it says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So as a young boy, he had to learn. He had to go through an education system. And it says that he kept increasing in wisdom. So you have these passages that will talk about his divine nature. Uh, and then you will have passages that talk about his human nature. Uh, as God, he created the universe. John 1, 3 says, all things came into being through him. That's God the Son. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And so we understand that he is the creator. Uh, but we also know that he was subject to human weakness, uh, that he could get tired, that he could get hungry. Uh, we think of in Matthew 4, 2, it says, And after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry, about as hungry as one could be, humanly speaking. Uh, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And yet Jesus could become tired. God doesn't sleep, but the humanity of Christ slept. God cannot die. He's eternal. But in, in his body, Jesus Christ could face physical death. In fact, Peter tells us that in his own body, he bore our sins. And we know that it was his humanity that could die and was placed ultimately in a grave and was resurrected on the third day. So I bring these up just simply to point out that there are times where Jesus, where when we look at a passage in Scripture, we say, oh, well, that's talking about his deity, such as when he can read people's minds or, you know, when he's talking to the Father before, uh, you know, glorify me together with the glory which we had before the world was. And then there's other times where he speaks from his human nature, when he's hungry, when he's tired, uh, you know, when he's weak. Uh, these are uh, certain passages. And I bring this up because there are times where we will look, and you have to follow me on this, there are times where we will look at certain passages related to election, and it will look at it from the divine side. It will look at it from what God is doing. Uh, and it's God alone. It's referencing him. And then there are other passages where we will look at election, and it will look at it from the human side, what's going on humanly speaking. And we have to keep these two constantly in the forefront of our thinking. So as we look at passages, we're going to bounce back and forth, but we have to hold them both together simultaneously. Now, currently, uh, and if you would have listened to me 25 years ago uh, teach on the doctrine of election, you probably would have heard something more in line with that of Dr. Charles Ryrie. Um, or Dr. Fruchtenbaum, or Dr. Wearsby, men that I love and appreciate greatly. Uh, but today, uh, I have shifted in my understanding such that it is more in line with people like Dr. Andy Woods or uh, Norman Geisler. Uh, and you'll hear me quote these people uh, because I think that that is the more correct view. And this is one of those things where, as time goes on, uh, our theology becomes refined I remember years ago, I was sitting in a class with Dr. Uh, Charles Ryrie, and uh, somebody asked him a question about, uh, and we were talking about election on, as a different subject, but somebody asked him where he stood on the new covenant. Did he think that it was for Israel only, or did he think that the church participated in that? And I remember his answer, and he came back after a pause for a few seconds. He said, well, he said, I guess it depends on what day of the week it is. And I think that frustrated the questioner. Uh, but I kind of appreciated the answer, to be honest, because here was a man who, after 50 years of studying the, the, that particular doctrinal issue, still did not have a full grasp on it and really could kind of bounce back and forth, could see both sides of the argument. So it was one of those things where he hadn't resolved the issue in his thinking. I remember some years ago listening to a series of lectures uh, by Chester McCauley, who's no longer with us. He's been graduated to heaven. Uh, but a wonderful, wonderful Bible teacher, one of my favorites, actually. And, uh, and he was talking about certain doctrinal issues. Uh, he said as he studies some things, you know, some things he accepts and, as true, and he accepts it into himself. Other things, he says, well, that's, he heard a teaching, he studied it, and he said, well, that's false, and I'm going to reject that. But he, he had a third classification. He had a category of things that he said were up on his theological shelf, uh, things that he had to temporarily suspend judgment on until he could study it well enough. And he said a lot of things would come off of his theological shelf that he could deal with one way or another. 
but he was also convinced that there were some things that would stay on his theological shelf until he uh, went to be with the Lord. And I think that is true for some doctrines. Now, I'm not going to say that's fully true for me for the doctrine of divine election. I, I do think I have some things settled in my mind, and you'll see that as we work through this material, as I make this presentation. But nonetheless, I think it is healthy at times to uh, be honest about something, and rather than immediately reject it or accept it, just to suspend judgment on until we can kind of figure out a little bit more about it. At the end of the day, God's revelation must be our guide. We must go on Scripture and not human reason. Reason will take us to a certain point, but there's a point where reason breaks down. I love Isaiah 118, where God says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And God is reasonable. I mean, he, he created language, and we're made in the image of God. We have intellect. We have volition. Uh, we have capacities within ourself, and we are finite analogs to God, theomorphs, as it were. And so God can come to us, and he can say, let us reason together. But later on in Isaiah, he says, but my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we reason together with God, but we also realize that his thinking and his ways transcend our ability to fully grasp. So at the end of the day, revelation must be our guide. And though we reason through Scripture, our reasoning ability is limited, and we must learn to live with certain unresolvable theological tensions. According to Norman Geisler, uh, and here I'm citing him uh, from his Systematic Theology, Volume 3, page 137, he says, quote, the mystery of the relationship between divine sovereignty and human free will has challenged the greatest Christian thinkers down through the centuries. Lewis Berry Chafer, and here I'm quoting him uh, from, his, uh, from an article he wrote in Bibliotheca Sacra called Biblical Theism, Divine Decrees. He says, quote, the doctrine of divine election is a cardinal teaching of the scriptures. Doubtless, it is attended with difficulties which are a burden upon all systems of theology alike, end quote. Warren Wearsby, and uh, here I'm citing him from his Bible Exposition Commentary, Volume 2. He says, quote, The mystery of divine sovereignty and human responsibility will never be resolved in this life. Both are taught in the Bible. Both are true and both are essential, end quote. And then I have a quote here from Dr. Charles Ryrie. Uh, who passed away a few years ago, and uh, this is from his uh, Basic Theology, of uh, page 359. He says, quote, No human mind will ever fully harmonize sovereignty and free will, but ignoring or downplaying one or the other in the interest of a supposed harmony will solve nothing, end quote. And I would also like to say that when discussing election with others, it's always best to maintain an attitude of love and grace, as this will generate more light than heat. A passage that has been a guide for me over the years on a number of different occasions is 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 and 25, which says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. With gentleness. And so... Uh, I know some Christians, and I must admit, you know, 30 years ago, I came with a fist-in-your-face attitude. I was, uh, I was argumentative and confrontational, and I know some Christians that are still that way. But over the years, and uh, by means of obedience to the Word of God and discipline in my Christian life, I have learned to apply 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 on more of a regular basis and uh, to try to demonstrate those qualities that are there. That doesn't mean that there isn't a storm raging in my soul. Sometimes there is, uh, but discipline in the Christian life means that we must play poker and we must uh, uh, obey the word regardless of how we feel. We are told to walk by faith, not feelings. So again, when discussing election with others, it's always best to maintain an attitude of love and grace, as, again, as this will generate more light than heat. Now, over the last couple days, I put together some major views on election. Now, this is not exhaustive, but these are just the major views, and I'll explain these. Now, regarding election and salvation, there are varying perspectives on the roles of divine intervention and human responsibility in the process of being saved. 
The major views are as follows. Strict Calvinism, which I recently wrote a critique of strict Calvinism, and I can include that in the email that I'll send out. But strict Calvinism adheres closely to the five points of Calvinism summarized by the acronym TULIP. Uh, that is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. By total depravity, they mean that people are completely unable to save themselves or even to seek God on their own due to their sinful nature. Uh, unconditional election means that God's choice of certain means that uh, refers to God's choice of certain individuals for salvation not based on any foreseen merit or action uh, on their part, but purely on his sovereign will. So the picture there is that God uh, knew that he would create uh, mankind. He knew that the fall would happen. He permitted the fall. And once the fall occurred, then all mankind is in a state of sin. And all of Adam's offspring are born uh, with a sin nature and are born in a state of sin. But they would say that people are completely unable to respond even to the gospel and that God must regenerate them. He must give them new life. He must give them the gift of faith. He must, he must give them a new desire to want to respond to the gospel. And uh, logically, it makes sense if you go off of total depravity, meaning total inability. I, I don't. I think that's a flawed system. But uh, nonetheless, um, they, would, they would understand uh, in strict Calvinism that there is the mass of humanity that is born into sin and trapped into sin, uh, but that God has elected to save some. And that's usually a small percentage. They'll never give you a quantity because they can't, but it's usually small, 2%, 5%. It's a small number, but that God has elected to save some, but that he leaves the rest to themselves, and they have no option of pardon uh, from their state, uh, and yet God holds them accountable for their state and will send them to the lake of fire for all eternity. And so uh, they would say that unconditional election means that God's choice of certain individuals for salvation was not based on any foreseen merit or action on their part, but purely on his sovereign will. They also teach what is called limited atonement, which means that Christ's death was intended to save only the elect not all of humanity. So they would say, well, God only elected some to be saved. And there are some that even hold to what's called double predestination, where they say that God not only elects some to be saved, but, but elects to damn everybody else uh, to the lake of fire. But either way, they believe in limited atonement, that Christ only died for those whom he elected to be saved. I remember asking a gentleman one time, he was a strict Calvinist, we were having a um, a casual conversation, and I asked him, I said, do you, when you're talking with an unbeliever, do you tell them that Christ died for them? He said, no. He said, I can't. He said, I don't, I don't know if Christ died for them because I don't know if they're one of the elect or not. I won't know until after they're saved, and even then I won't know if they're truly saved or if they had a spurious faith. That's another matter for another day. I said, well, do you tell them that God loves them? He said, no. He said, I don't know if they're one of the elect. He said, I don't know if God loves them, and so I said, he said, I don't, I don't tell them that. I thought it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, but they also believe, they also teach what is called irresistible grace, which means that when God calls his elect to salvation, they cannot resist his will. It is irresistible. And so those whom he elects, he calls, and those whom he calls will respond. Uh, and then they teach what is called the perseverance of the saints, which means that those whom God has elected and saved will persevere in faith and will not ultimately fall away. And you'll find this common amongst people who advocate for lordship salvation. They will say that a true faith uh, is one that is given by God, and it guarantees that they will pursue in good works and faithfulness to the Lord because God will cause them uh, to produce these good works. And I recently wrote an article on James 2, 14 through 26, Faith Without Works is Dead, and I challenge uh, some of that way of thinking. Then we have moderate Calvinism. Now, moderate Calvinism adheres to the basic tenets of Calvinism, but with some modifications or a softer interpretation. Uh, these often hold to a form of unlimited atonement, which means that Christ's atonement is sufficient for all, but effective only for the elect. Uh, they're also more open to dialogue with other theological perspectives and tend to avoid the more deterministic implications of strict Calvinism. 
and I have found that to be true. Uh, then we have a group that is commonly referred to as Calvinianism. Now this is a marriage here between that seeks to blend Calvinism and Arminianism. And uh, I do not uh, agree. I'm neither a Calvinist nor am I an Arminian. I don't, I don't go with either camp. I refer to myself as a Biblicist. And, uh, and so my uh, understanding of election is nuanced. Uh, but uh, uh, I do not agree with Arminians. I agree with them on some things, but not on other things. For, for example, they many would would say that works are necessary uh, for salvation to keep yourself saved, and they also believe that one can forfeit uh, his or her salvation. And that's just a backdoor approach, really, to works is all that that is. And uh, and I do not believe that uh, one can forfeit their salvation. They can forfeit a good life. They can forfeit the joy of the Lord. Uh, they can bring upon themselves divine discipline if they step into a lifestyle of sin. And they can forfeit uh, eternal rewards. And all of these are quite severe. Uh, but uh, salvation itself, I do not believe one can forfeit. I used to. I mean, 35 years ago, when I was very, very young in the faith, I, 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 I believe that. But I've uh, since changed my mind on that issue. But Calvinianism is a view that you will find really in a lot of circles, and this seeks to blend elements of Calvinism and Arminianism, seeking a middle ground concerning God's sovereignty and human volition. Uh, Calvinians tend to lean toward unlimited atonement, resistible grace, uh, that God's election is based on foreknowledge of who would believe, and the belief that saints can turn to a prolonged uh, sinful lifestyle without losing their salvation. Uh, I would put many in the free grace camp in, in that group, although they may not take the, the term Calminian. Again, these are, these are uh, terms that people have tried to put out there to try to explain a certain theological camp and the nuances of that camp. Arminianism is a theological system that emphasizes God's conditional election based on foreknowledge. By the way, when I hear Arminianism, I typically think of uh, Methodist churches. When I hear uh, strict Calvinism, I generally think of Presbyterian churches, uh, kind of on opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so Arminianism, again, is a theological system that emphasizes God's conditional election based on foreknowledge. Arminians see people as corrupted by sin, but that they are able to respond to God's call to salvation. Uh, now, I would agree with that. And they also adhere to unlimited atonement, resistible grace, uh, but they believe that Christians are able to forfeit their salvation, uh, which I think is wrong. Uh, and this means ultimately that good works are necessary to retain salvation. Uh, and then you have Catholicism. Uh, which teaches that salvation is open to all and involves both God's grace and human cooperation. In the Catholic view, both faith and works are essential for salvation. Faith is the foundational response to God's grace, but it must be accompanied by works of love and obedience. In Catholicism, the sacraments are seen as vital means of grace. Now, when they use the term grace, they use it really more in the sense of of something that God gives. They use it in the noun form, where it's something that God gives in little doses. And Catholicism is kind of a strange little beast, because they believe that if you are baptized as an infant or as an adult, you wash away original sin, uh, and then you believe in Christ, but you must also, um, you must also uh, repent of your sins, you must also join the church, you must also practice the sacraments, you must uh, uh, partake of the Lord's Supper on a regular basis, and of course they hold to transubstantiation with the teaching that the body and uh, that the bread and the wafer, or that the bread and the, and the red juice become the literal body and the literal blood of Christ, that without losing its former taste, that it, that it is nonetheless the literal body and literal blood of Christ. But their understanding of grace is that every time you partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, God gives you a, a little bit of grace. It's like a cup, and he adds a little bit of grace. Now, this is where their theology gets a little, a little strange to me. Uh, because if you are baptized, if you have believed, if you have joined the church and you have partaken of, of say, the Lord's Supper for several years, then you have received a measure of God's grace. And so you have a measure of righteousness sufficient to keep you from going to the lake of fire. But if your cup is not completely full, 
uh, then you don't have enough righteousness to go straight to heaven when you leave this world. And so that's where they introduce the doctrine of purgatory. Because in purgatory, if you don't have enough righteousness to get to gain you immediate entrance into heaven, uh, then you you don't go straight to the lake of you don't go to the lake of fire, but you go to a place of torment and suffering where you have to pay pay for your own sins. You have to atone for your own sins, and uh, and of course then you get into issues of indulgences, which is what brought about the Reformation. It was one of the key doctrines uh, where people were taught that they could pay for people to be released from purgatory. What was the statement? When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Uh, and it was quite a racket. They, they were bringing in quite a bit of money. And a Luther uh, challenged this. And he basically, he posted in the form of a question, but it was basically to the Pope uh, asking, you know, hey, look, if you have the power to release everybody from purgatory, uh, why are you putting a price on it? Why don't you just display grace and love and just release everybody? Of course, that upset the Pope. He didn't like that, and that was part of the controversy. Uh, but they also believe that these saints uh, that they have canonized, these uh, super class of saints, have a surplus. So these people have been so good that their cup is overflowing. So they have a surplus of good works. And so what they do is they pray to the saints with the hope that some of that surplus can be applied to Uncle Billy or Aunt Betty or Cousin Bob or whoever's in purgatory, that that surplus of works can be applied to them and thus shorten their stay or get them out. So Catholicism has kind of some goofy ideas on some things. It's really, really fascinating to, to study. But again, that they think of the sacraments as vital means of grace uh, for instance, baptism is considered necessary for salvation as it washes away original sin and incorporates a person into the body of Christ. The Eucharist, penance, and other sacraments further sustain and deepen a believer's relationship with God. So they're full-blown works, full-blown works uh, with regard to how they understand salvation and election. And Pelagianism uh, is really a theological perspective that is considered heretical by most Christian traditions. And if you ever study uh, the teachings of Pelagian um, and his conflict uh, with Augustine, you'll know more about that. But he's, he's basically a heretic. Uh, Pelagianism emphasizes human free will and, de and denies original sin, uh, teaching that people are born morally neutral and that each person can choose to do good or evil without the necessity of divine grace. Pelagians emphasize that salvation can be achieved through human effort and moral striving, and they see God's grace as helping but not necessary for living a righteous life or achieving salvation. So Pelagianism uh, teaches that you can totally be saved by your own works. Um, God may help you, but it's not necessary. And, of course, that's, uh, that's just straight heresy. So I've tried to give you a spectrum here of these major views. Now, the above categories uh, are really simplified presentations with detailed nuances that others might seek to expand and to clarify. Uh, Dr. Paul Inns has a book called Moody's Handbook of Theology, and, uh, and he, he does a really, really good job of explaining a lot of the different views. I think he does a really phenomenal job of explaining Catholicism. So really recommend his book. I think that that's a, a good resource to have. So my purpose in presenting these major views is just simply to provide a basic construct of the major views. And what follows is my understanding of the doctrine of election as it is taught in the Word of God. So the first thing I want to jump into here is I want to talk about God's sovereignty. And I really think that this needs to be the starting point so that we under, when we understand election, we must understand it as starting with God. Now, the Bible reveals that God is sovereign over his creation. Psalm 1016 says, The Lord is king. The Lord is king forever and ever. Psalm 135, verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. Uh, Daniel 4.35, here Nebuchadnezzar, this is his conversion experience, and he's sharing his own conversion in Daniel 4, fascinating uh, chapter. He says, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
Isaiah 46.10, God himself declares, My purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. And uh, 1 Timothy 6.15 tells us that he is the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Ephesians 1.11 tells us that he works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, I am encouraged by the sovereignty of God. I was thinking about the passage earlier in Daniel uh, where he talks about how it is God who, who sets up kings and God who removes kings. And, you know, we think about even in our own governmental system and the democratic process that we have, we're really a republic with a representative form of government is really what we are. But nonetheless, we have votes that we bring people into the office. And assuming that everything is done on board um, and, and fairly, uh, we go through this uh, process of election. But behind all that is really the sovereignty of God, because he is ultimately the one who controls the outcome of events, and he raises up kings and he removes kings. And he raised up Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar uh, was an unbeliever for most of his life, and we might even regard him as a pretty wicked king. In, Dan in Jeremiah 25, God refers to him as my servant, my servant. And I realize that God today uh, can rule through a Nebuchadnezzar. He can. Uh, I prefer that God would send us a good King Josiah, that he would send us somebody righteous who would reign uh, in righteousness, who would think from a place of divine viewpoint. And I pray to God that we get that. But I know ultimately that he is sovereign, that he is in control of these things. And of course, we have to do the best we can and be the best we can and make the best choices that we can. But ultimately, at the end of the day, God is always on his throne. He is always in absolute sovereign control. And we have to think these things. We have to learn to rest in these things. And this is certainly true uh, with regard to uh, the doctrine of election. So all of this is true. However, the Bible also reveals that God sovereignly created both angels and people with intellect and volition and has granted them a modicum of freedom to act as free moral agents. I love the passage over in uh, um, Genesis 25, let's see if I, excuse me, Genesis 1, where we're told here in Genesis 1, 26, where it says, Then God said, Let us. Now the us there uh, is an implied uh, plurality. Uh, the members of the Godhead here, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are talking to each other. And they said, let us make man in our image. Tselem uh, is the word there. And it's the idea that we are image bearers, the imago Dei, uh, that we are made in the image of God. And uh, he says, that according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and so on. And so God created mankind special. And even after the fall, it's very interesting, because if you read Genesis 9 and James, uh, even after the fall, we retain the image of God. It is still present in us. And everybody that we meet retains that image. Now, granted, we're corrupted by sin, and, the, and, uh, and, and though the image is effaced, it's not erased. And I also realize that everybody that I meet is an immortal, that everybody I meet will live forever, and they will live forever either in heaven with God or they will live forever away from God in the lake of fire. But they are still, uh, they still bear the image of God, and as such, they are still free moral agents, free moral agents. But God created the first couple as finite analogs to himself, as theomorphs, and they were to function as theocratic administrators over the earth. They were to rule over the earth. And so, again, God created both angels and people, people in particular is what I'm focusing on here, with intellect and volition, and has granted them a modicum of freedom to act as free moral agents. According to McChesney, and here I'm citing from the Unger's Bible Dictionary, uh, which is a very good book, and this is on the sovereignty of God, I do recommend uh, having that in your library. If you don't have the Unger's Bible Dictionary, it's a good one to have. A nice single volume set, nice single volume. He says, quote, uh, that God's sovereignty is not to be viewed in any such way as to abridge the reality of the moral freedom of God's responsible creatures or to make them anything else than the arbiters of their own eternal destinies. God has seen fit to create beings with the power of choice between good and evil. He rules over them in justice and wisdom and grace, end quote. 
Now, at all times and without external restraint, God remains in constant sovereign control, guiding his creation through history. I'm comforted by this because I like to know that God is in control. And I think the more that I study the Bible and the more that I study the very character of God and the attributes of God, uh, the more I find myself being relaxed about life. Things, uh, they, things don't get me wrong. Things still upset me. I get a little fired up on some things, but I'm able to frame it from the divine perspective because I know that ultimately God is in control. And I know that reality, uh, all reality, is under his uh, sovereign control. And when I think about reality, I think about reality in the material world in which we live, the physical universe, but there's also the spiritual realm where angels exist and act, where Satan and demons operate, and what goes on in that spiritual realm somehow fits all around us uh, as though it's like a, a laid over top of the material world, but is somehow integrated in such a way that uh, that angels and Satan and demons uh, have impact. They're able to impact our lives, and we impact their lives through how we conduct ourselves, through prayer, but they're here, they're present, they're probably around me right now. Uh, but nonetheless, you have this spiritual realm and this physical realm, and these together make up reality. That is, that is all of reality. But only the Word of God gives that to us. It gives us that insight into reality about things that we could never know except that God has spoken, and what He has spoken has been inscripturated and written down for our benefit, and it helps us to understand these things. Uh, but I also realize that behind all of that stands God, that he is the sovereign. And so without restraint, God remains in constant sovereign control, guiding his creation through history. He interferes in the affairs of mankind. He interferes, and thank God that he interferes. In fact, the greatest uh, disruption in the history of the human race was the hypostatic union. When God the Son came into this world and took upon himself humanity, uh, he disrupted uh, the world at that time and uh, Satan's affairs of what was going on. And you see passages like John 3, 19, which says that the light has come into the world. That's Jesus Christ. That's God the Son in hypostatic union. That the light came into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And so they, 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 they turned away from the light, kind of like cockroaches run to hide when the, when the, when the, when the lights come on in the kitchen. Uh, and, uh, and so, but nonetheless, I am comforted that God interferes he interferes uh, in the affairs of mankind, and his unseen hand works behind all their activities, controlling and directing history as he wills. And God has interfered in my life. I can tell you, he's disrupted my life on a few occasions, sometimes in a very pleasant way, uh, by blessing me in ways that I did not expect and did not see coming, and I'm very thankful for that. But other times he has disrupted my life by means of divine discipline. And of course, he's sovereign, and I thank him in all these matters because I trust him. But, you know, back when I was a boy in the mid-70s, my uh, grandmother came to live in my home for several years, and she was, a, she was a disruption in my life. She was an anomaly to me. She was a question mark. I didn't understand who she was. And the family and the values and the culture that I was raised in and the way that my parents were and their values was absolute worldliness, absolutely to the core worldliness. And it was true for all of my aunts and uncles and cousins and friends and everybody around me. There are a hundred people around me and they're all thinking uh, human viewpoint. And then in comes this little lady. I'm eight and she's 80. And, uh, and she comes into my home and she begins to read the Bible. She's reading the Bible a lot. She's a, she reads the Bible every day, several times a day. She prays a lot. She worships the Lord and she does it openly. She, she sings to the Lord. Uh, she, had, uh, she was a double major in college. She had a degree in English and music. And so she could play the, uh, the violin. She could play the piano. And it was just very, uh, very talented. And she dressed well. She was a very sharp dresser. She carried herself very well. She was a woman of dignity and poise. And uh, she just, she represented really, I would say, the highest and best uh, in humanity, <laughs> as, as I could see it. She was just, she was just a big question mark to me. And I was eight and she was 80 and we stood about eye to eye. And for several years, she was in my home, and she taught me the gospel. She led me to faith in Christ. She helped me to memorize chapters in the Bible, Psalm 1, the 23rd Psalm, Psalm 100, and a number of other individual verses. But she modeled Christ. She lived out Christ. 
And I saw it. I didn't just hear it. I saw it on full display. She was a woman of faith and a woman of dignity and a woman of poise. And she carried herself so well. And I was just, I didn't understand it. I even mocked it at a few times because I was a, a, f a stupid young boy in many ways. But after she left our home, and later on when I fell into sin and into worldliness myself, uh, my life came crashing down. And when it came crashing down and I had no place to look but up uh, to God, I began to reflect back on my past. And the scriptures that my grandmother taught me, I began to pull up in my memory. They were still there in my memory, and I began to pull them up and to cite them, even when I was homeless, even when I was living on the streets of Las Vegas for several weeks at the Salvation Army and, and other places. And scripture was still present in my mind. And it, and it, it gave me a, 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 a reference point to be able to think about God. And it produced in me, uh, at that moment, uh, a stable, it had a stabilizing effect in my soul. And when, when I began to think, well, how do I live this Christian life? Uh, when I reflected back on the past, I had a template. I had an example. I had my grandmother. And so I began to mimic her. I began to model my life after her. Well, that intrusion, that plant, that disruption that God put in my life when I was a child... Uh, had a very, very wonderful effect later in life. And God has a way of doing this. And even Christ coming into the world is a disruption. It is coming into Satan's kingdom of darkness. And he comes into the world. He crashes into the world. And he disrupts the world. And he lives the absolutely sinless life. He lives the righteous life that we cannot. And he goes to a cross and he dies a death we deserve. And he goes into the grave and he's resurrected on the third day, never to die again, Romans 6, 9 tells us. And then he offers us eternal life as a free gift, a free gift paid in full by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a disruption in the human race. So God meddles in the affairs of mankind. He does it in small ways. He does it in very large ways. But we must realize that God is always in sovereign control, that he interferes in the affairs of mankind and his unseen hand works behind all their activities, controlling and directing history as he wills. And we know from Scripture that God possesses certain immutable attributes and that he never acts inconsistently with his nature. For example, because God is righteous, all his actions and commands are just. Because God is immutable, his moral perfections never change. Because God is eternal, he is righteous forever. Because God is omniscient, his righteous acts are always predicated on perfect knowledge. And because God is omnipotent, he is always able to execute his righteous will. And because God is love, his judgments can be merciful toward the undeserving and the humble. And I bring in these other attributes because sometimes when I'm talking with, uh, well, say some of my Calvinist friends, even my strict Calvinist friends, uh, they will emphasize the sovereignty of God really to the exclusion or to the diminishment of other attributes such that they're so far down and I remember years ago listening to uh, uh, a series of lectures by Dr. S. Lewis Johnson, who was a Greek professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, and a very, very skilled man, a very gifted teacher, and I appreciated uh, some of his lessons. Uh, he was friends, actually, with Colonel Theme, they, uh, and he would reference him throughout uh, his lectures at times. Now, they were on different poles. And I think Colonel Theme is right, uh, was right, and is right on his views on election. And I think Dr. Johnson is wrong. Uh, but I remember listening to a lecture one time by Dr. S. Lewis Johnson, and he was talking about the attributes of God, and he opened up by saying something along these lines. He, he opened up by saying, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And he is immutable and righteous and just and loving and so on. And then he began to uh, sort of drift into the other attributes. But he so emphasized the sovereignty of God that it was like the other attributes just kind of fell out of place. And I find that sometimes it's that imbalance of emphasizing one attribute to the exclusion of another that creates these, uh, these theological extremes 
in people's mind. It's just like people that emphasize God's love to the exclusion of his righteousness. And you'll find that some of these people uh, teach uh, universalism, that nobody goes to the lake of fire, that God loves everybody. Everybody's going to heaven, you know, that sort of thing. And you'll find people that will go to those extremes, and you must hold those attributes constantly uh, in, 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 in relationship to each other. And that becomes a challenge, but uh, welcome to Christianity. Uh, so moving into the next section here, the Bible affirms God's sovereignty and human volition. He, uh, the Bible affirms God's sovereignty and human volition. Shortly after God created the heavens and the earth, he sovereignly chose to create mankind in his image. We talked about that a moment ago. And we are created as finite analogs to God. But we are endowed with intellectual and volitional capabilities. God's intention was that uh, the first humans would function as theocratic administrators to rule over his creation. And when God made his decision to create people in his image, he willingly limited himself to allow them the freedom to operate as responsible moral creatures and not mere automatons. In other words, when you read Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7, and you see the fall, you realize that God permitted that to happen. Now, I recently had an article that was published in, uh, in the Journal of uh, Dispensational Theology on knowing and doing the will of God. And I break the will of God down into five categories. And you have his sovereign will, uh, you have his directive will, his permissive will, his overruling will, and his, um, his will as it relates to providence. Uh, but nonetheless, God directed Adam and Eve not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was his directive will. Uh, but when it came time for them to be tempted, to be tested, they did eat. He permitted that to happen. He knew it was going to happen. He was there. He could have stopped it. He didn't. Therefore, he permitted that to happen. That's his permissive will. And by the way, anytime somebody sins, that's their permiss That's his permissive will. He permits that to happen. But then God, after he judges Satan and judges them and pronounces judgment, he then sends them out of the garden and he places an angel with a flaming sword at the entrance of the garden such that they could not go back in if, even if they wanted to. And that is his overruling will. And so we see examples, but nonetheless God uh, permits mankind uh, to function uh, not as mere automatons. We're not robots, okay? So people have intellect, they have volition, and God is not a bully. He doesn't force himself on anybody. He's a perfect gentleman. Now, this self-imposed restraint, and we must understand it, it is a self-imposed restraint by God is not unusual, for he restrained himself in other ways. Uh, for example, every time God made a promise or a covenant, he bound himself to his word such that he cannot do otherwise. Scripture reveals in Numbers 23, 19, that God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man. Now listen, people lie, right? And, uh, and I've met people that intentionally lie, but God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? You see, God has integrity. And this means that God will not lie. In fact, God cannot lie. He cannot lie. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, uh, Even though we are faithless, he remains faithful. Notice, for he cannot deny himself. Now, we are faithless. We are faithless. Um, and, uh, and the verb there, apostuo, means unbelieving, is what it means. Uh, but we are faithless, but he remains faithful. Why does God remain faithful? Because he cannot deny himself. You see, when God makes a promise, he binds himself to that promise such that God cannot do otherwise. Now, we understand this to some degree in the human realm, because any time we make a promise to somebody, we limit ourselves, we bind ourselves to that person to give them assurance. And I think of marriage vows where I've done 20 plus weddings over the years, officiated, and they come together and they say, I love you, uh, and I promise to be faithful to you for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and sickness and in health, till death do us part. Well, those are nice words. But that is an untested statement. And it takes trials to bring out whether or not the person who said those words has integrity. 
and whether or not that person will keep his word or her word, because a promise is only as good as the one who makes it. It is only as strong as the one who makes it. And when God makes a promise, such as in Hebrews, where he says, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Now, that's a promise. Now, we know that God has integrity, and God is not a man that he should lie. And he does, he cannot deny himself. And so when God makes a promise, he limits himself. He binds himself to his word, to his promise. And why does he do that? He does that for us, for us to give us assurance that his word is true. Um, in Titus 1, 2, Paul talks about the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. And it's interesting because when I generally teach on eternal life, I talk about what God can do and what God will do. But Paul here predicates it on what he cannot do because there are some things God cannot do. God cannot cease to be God. God cannot sin. God cannot fail. And, and notice he ties it here when he says, God who cannot lie, that's predicated on what? A promise that God who cannot lie promised long ages ago. Hebrews 6, 18 says that it is impossible for God to lie. And uh, by the way, when the word, when God speaks and when he has spoken and what he has spoken has been inscripturated, it's been written down for our benefit, we can trust God at his word. And when he says, I will never leave you or forsake you, I don't care how you feel. I don't care if you're sick. I don't care if you're tired. I don't care if you're hungry. I don't care what you've been through. God's word is true. And God keeps his word. He cannot fail. He cannot deny himself because God has integrity. And it's impossible for God to lie. It's absolutely impossible. So I bring this up just simply to point out that God has given people volition and freedom to act, but he also holds them accountable for their actions. But, but for God to give people volition means that he gives them a limited uh, opportunity to exercise their volition. So as the sovereign of the universe, God will judge everyone, uh, as the scripture tells us, for there is no partiality with God. And uh, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And Paul wrote, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. To say that it is without partiality means that it extends to everyone, to all humanity. And it's because of understandings like this that I absolutely stand in opposition to strict Calvinism. I, I could not go there. Uh, I just, I, it's just way too much of a flawed system. So though all mankind is fallen, being corrupted because of their sinful flesh, they still retain the image of God and the ability to function intellectually and volitionally. Even after the fall, even after the fall, uh, you see passages like Genesis 9, 6, when it says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. In the image of God. So the image of God is still retained, which means that ability to think and act is still present. 1 Corinthians eleven seven: For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image of and the glory of God, the image and the glory of God, James 3, 9. With it, that is with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. This means that mankind is able, in a limited way, to understand God's general revelation and special revelation, and to respond volitionally if they choose. If they choose. Now, our hour is up, and so I am going to pause the uh, study here so that we can have some Q&A, and uh, I'm sure that this will uh, open this up here a little bit. 
Okay, so uh, we've made some good headway here. So let's uh, take some uh, Q&A for a few minutes. Uh, is that Winnie or Judd? Judd. Okay, Judd. Uh, I, I really agree 100% that Calvinism and Arminianism are just two totally flawed systems. And <clears throat> instead of trying to compromise them like Calvinianism, I think you just have to throw them both out and go back to Scripture mm -hmm. and you know come up with a system that's biblical, which is, I, I assume, where you're, where you're heading. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trying. Yeah. yeah. And, and then secondly, uh, did you, uh, you said you uh, agree with Norm, Ge Norm Geiser. Like, have you heard... He's very, or he was, very, very funny. I just loved his sense of humor. Have you heard his joke on strict Calvinism? I uh, know. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, a strict Calvinist died and went to heaven, and there were two lines that people were getting on. One said sovereignty, had a big sign that said sovereignty. One had a big sign that said free will. So the man being a strict Calvinist, of course, got on the sovereignty line. And he was on that line a long time. It was moving very slowly. And when we finally got to the front, the angel at the front of the line said, friend, who told you to get on this line? And he said, well, nobody told me I chose this line. And he mm -hmm. said, well, friend, you're on the wrong line. You need to get on the free will line. Mm -hmm. So the man walks all the way back, gets on the free will line. He's like very frustrated, waits an equally long time, gets to the front of the line. And the angel at the front of the line said, friend, why did you choose this line? And he said, no, I didn't choose this line. Somebody told me to get on this line. He said, friend, you're on the wrong line. Hmm. <laughs> That's funny. And you could see that reasoning. I could see Geisler saying something like that. I remember watching a video of his uh, here just about six months ago in which he talks about why he's not a strict Calvinist. And of course, in typical Geisler fashion, he walks through the scriptures in a way that just is very compelling, and the scripture speaks quite plainly. Um, I like a lot of his writings. He's a, he's a good teacher. Um, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Do we have any other questions or comments? Hey, Steve, can you uh, again uh, name the book that you talked about, Catholicism? Oh, yeah, uh, Moody's Handbook of Theology. Moody's Handbook of Theology by Dr. Paul Inns, E-N-N-S, E-N-N-S, Dr. Paul Inns. Very, very good book. I, I like that a lot. It's a, it's a very good read. Great. That was for Laura. I think okay. We have Steve next. Okay, Steve, go ahead, buddy. Uh, yeah, uh, just a comment, just a quick update on Deacon. I got it from Michael. Oh yeah, he, uh, he did pass during uh, during surgery about a uh, half hour ago. So mm. everyone could pray for his family; it would be much appreciated. Yeah, let's pray now, dear Father. We come before your throne of grace, and Father, you know what's going on with uh, with the Deacon family. Father, we just. Pray that you will comfort them, Father, that you will surround them with loving people who will support them, who will help them, Father, through this difficult time. Father, we just pray your grace upon them now, Father, upon that family. Father, we know that you care. We just pray that uh, that you will manifest yourself to them in a way that will be honoring to you and, and comforting to them. Father, we just uplift them to you now. We come before your throne of grace with this request. Father, we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that update, Steve. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, nothing in the gallery, Steve. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, why don't we go ahead and close it out with a word of prayer then, and, uh, and then we'll pick up next week, uh, continuing our subject on election. If you'll bow your heads with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can call you Father. We know that at a point in time, nearly 2,000 years ago, you sent your Son into the world. And he came into the world and took upon himself humanity. And he lived an absolutely righteous life and went to a cross and died a death he did not deserve in order that we might have a life that we could never earn. And he paid our sin debt in full upon the cross. And after he said, it is finished, he then gave up his spirit 
and he died, and he went into a grave, and he was raised again to life. He conquered sin and death, never to die again. And having completed our salvation at the cross, it is now available to us, free, as a gift to all who will receive it by faith and faith alone. Because man needs only Christ to be saved, no one else and nothing more. Father, we thank you uh, for all that you have done in our lives, and we pray that as we continue the study, that this will be a time of fruitful understanding, uh, that we might be able to understand these difficult issues. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Recording stopped.